So things are going to start getting a little out of order, and we're going to use our historical understanding to keep things in order. But they're done this way on purpose. There's a reason. What have we learned so far? We've learned who Daniel was. We've learned how men see the great kings of the earth, and God revealed unto to Nebuchadnezzar what's going to come to pass. And we've seen that God dealt with Nebuchadnezzar very specifically. And we've seen that Daniel was there to see the transfer from the head of gold to the arms of silver. And so it's helping us to understand how this works. Makes it very clear. Because So I say, there's a kingdom coming after you, but when's it coming? What's it going to be like? Well, we can see the first step. We've already seen testimony of it. Belshazzar's ruling in Babylon one day, he gets found wanting and then the next day he's dead and Darius the Mede takes over Babylon and the arms of silver begin. So I want to make a couple of comments about that. These are, you know, we'll get to reading in a minute. <clears throat> the head of gold, who ruled the king of Babylon? Nebuchadnezzar. He had absolute power to look at you and say, do what I say or I'm going to make your house a dunghill. Okay? <laughs> he, he had absolute power in his kingdom. Now we get to the arms of silver. Why are there arms of silver? Two different arms. Because what's going to follow on, we read about Darius the Mede, but it's the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. They unite together. There are some people who believe that the Medes are the ancestors of today who we know as the Kurds in Kurdistan in northern Iraq just to give you an idea of where Medea is. It's up in the hill country. The Medeans had been around for a long time as a people united and fighting against Assyria for many years. But they unite with this new kingdom out of southern to them called the Persians. And those two arms come together and they conquer Babylon, which is what? The center of the earth. And it will be again. It's the place where men will go. That's the place. By taking Babylon, they testified to everybody around, we're now the big boys in town. And we will see when we study Persia a little bit more that the Medes and the Persians weren't equal. The Medes were smaller. Persians were bigger. So when you see the bear of the Median Persian kingdom, it lifts up on one side stronger on one side than it is on the other. And so what happens is it's the Persians who really take over. Now another sidelight just to talk about because people ask these things. Where does Esther fit into all of this? Where is she? Who is a Hashuerus in Esther? Well most people that I've studied believe that a Hashuerus is not a term that means um, a name. It's not, it's not Joseph. It's great and mighty king. It's like saying Pharaoh. Mm. So the fact that she married a Hashuerus doesn't tell you who he is. So people argue all the time about who he is. Now we have another interesting piece of information. Isaiah prophesies of a great king named Cyrus who would let the people go. It's prophesied that it would happen. I didn't have time to go dig into all of it, but we'll probably give you some of the scriptures when we get to that part. He, he does that. So who was Cyrus? I want to prove that Cyrus is the son of Esther. I'd love to prove that, but I can't. But I can't. It just can't be done. So we really don't know in secular history who Ahasuerus was. But we know that there was a change in the book of Esther, that Mordecai was made a ruler in the kingdom, that the Amalekites were finally wiped out, and that um, in that place, the Medes and the Persians, it was Cyrus, the mighty king, who made the first decree that the Jews could go home. The trouble is, is they didn't obey quite the way they were supposed to. And so what happens is in the timeline, it gets a little funky. We're going to read about Daniel saying that, uh, you know, 70 years were determined. And we'll have a whole chart that we'll put up about that. 
But if you calculate out those years and the best that I know how to do it, it doesn't quite match. But what you'll read in Nehemiah and Zechariah and Ezra, and you'll get the idea that the Jews didn't quite do what they were supposed to do. But Esther did what she was supposed to do and had a great effect in the fact that when Medes and Persians conquered Babylon, they let the people of Israel go back home and they rebuilt it. And we'll talk about that. But I wanted you to kind of get the historical context here and say those things because it comes up in your mind, who is this and who is that? And I wish I knew who the King Esther was married to. And I've read lots of opinions, but they all disagree and I, I just not smart enough or don't have a revelation enough to know the answer in case anybody's wondering. But I'd like to believe that she was with the mighty king of the Persians and that Cyrus was either that king or was her son. I don't know, so don't know. So um, we'll move forward. Did anybody think of any other questions during the break that they really want to talk about the first five chapters? Or is everybody good? It's a lot. It gets tiring after a while. But we're going to make this. We're going to get this thing done. Chapter 6. Pretty amazing. So Darius is now ruler in Babylon. And he's got to set up a bureaucracy. You know, these bureaucracies are important. because Somebody's got to manage the tax collecting and make sure that everything's taken care of. And there's got to be judges over different groups of people. And just like we've got a president and a bureaucracy and then you got governors and you got mayors and you got local school boards and you got, you know, it's, this is what happens. You set up these government agencies to take care of all this stuff and steal your money. So it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes over the whole kingdom. So he's going to divide the kingdom, I, I believe here, the kingdom of Babylon. We're not talking about the Persia. They've already got, the, the administration of Persia already exists. They've just conquered Babylon. So they've got to take care of Babylon. So Darius says, I'm going to split it up into 120 princes over the whole kingdom. And over these were going to be three presidents of whom Daniel was the first that the princes might give account unto them and the king didn't have to deal with it, basically. Okay? And that the king would take no damage really means he wouldn't lose out on any tax revenue. That's really what it means, okay? So Daniel is recognized for who he is. Even though he'd been in Babylon all this time, now Darius takes over Babylon, everybody goes, yeah, that Daniel guy, he's amazing. So he sets Daniel as the first of the three presidents over the 120 people who rule over the 120 provinces of Babylon. Okay? Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Reminds you of Joseph? There was an excellent spirit. There was an anointing upon him to where he was so obviously aware and amazing that the king recognized him and said I, you know what this guy's awesome i'm gonna put him in charge okay and the presidents and princes the other two presidents and all the princes of the 120 places they sought to find occasion against daniel concerning the kingdom but they couldn't find any fault they were looking for some way to cast him down because they were jealous of him they could find no occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Isn't that amazing? They had nothing to say against him. They couldn't find anything to put on a TV commercial and talk about how bad he was. <laughs> then said these men, we will not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. There's only one thing we can do. We've got to trip him up because we know he won't deviate from the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, the counselors, the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute, make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, except for you, O king, he's going to be cast into a den of lions. I mean, we go from fiery furnaces to dens of lions. It's pretty brutal. Now, O king, establish the decree. Sign the writing that it will never be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be altered. And this is what they had. This is the way the Medes and the Persians worked. Once it was written, the king signed it, stamped it, it could not be altered. The king couldn't alter it. That was the, the way that they worked. And these guys knew that. So they figured, okay, we'll just make a law that counteracts the laws of Daniel's God, and then he's stuck. And we got him. Now when Daniel knew the writing was signed, what did he do? He went into his house, 
His windows were open in his chamber towards Jerusalem, kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he always had done before. He did not change. He would not be defiled by the king's meat. He would not be, his, his friends that were like him would not bow to Nebuchadnezzar's image. And he was not going to change the fact that he sought his God three times a day looking towards Jerusalem. Now this is important because much of what we're going to see going forward, Daniel's really concerned with what's going to happen with Jerusalem. Because remember, they're in captivity. At this point, all the Jews are living in Babylon, Persia, the east. They're not in Jerusalem. And they're living there and they're, they're raising families and they've got jobs and crops and they've got all this stuff going on. And you can read a lot about that in Ezra and Nehemiah. They're, they're destroyed as a nation. But their God has declared that they will be reformed. And Daniel knows this. We're going to find a little more about how he knows this. And in his knowing of this, he's praying towards Jerusalem all the time, Father, your will be done. That's really what he's praying, okay? So he just goes like he did always. These men assembled. They found Daniel praying, making supplication before his God. They came near, spake before the king concerning the king's decree. You signed a decree that every man shall ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast in the den of lions. The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, did not regard you, O king, nor the decree that you signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself. At least he humbled himself to recognize it was his own fault own fault and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him he tried to find a way to get out of it isn't there some way I can get out of this then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king know O king that the law of the Medes and the Persians is that no decree nor a statute which the king establishes may be changed then the king commanded and they brought Daniel cast him into the den of lions now the king spake and said unto Daniel thy God whom you serve continue he will deliver thee and a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den. The king sealed it with his own signet, with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. The king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. No music was brought to him, and he could not sleep. Now, this King Darius just conquered Babylon, and he loved Daniel so much because of all that he saw in Daniel, the excellent spirit in Daniel. And look at the relationship. He, this guy goes fast and no music, can't sleep all night long because Daniel, the guy he loves, is in the lion's den. I mean, it's a big deal. This is the relationship. But Daniel is being tested just like his friends were tested. Bow. Or you're going, going in a fiery furnace. No supplication to God or you're going in a den of lions. But, you know, God delivers them out of them all. Okay. Verse 19, the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom you serve continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth that they have not hurt me, for as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. No, but, but listen to Daniel, though. O king, live forever. Uh -huh. He had an understanding, and you'll see this throughout his service. He served Nebuchadnezzar. Served him. Mm -hmm. He served Darius. He served him. He recognized who God had put in authority, and he served him. Mm -hmm. He didn't fight him. He didn't rebel against them. He didn't secretly plot against them. He served them. He said, O king, live forever. He bowed to him really, is what he's doing. And it's an important principle to understand. Serve your God first and above all else, but honor men that are in authority. Scripture tells us that. You know, we don't speak against them. We don't curse them. We bless. We don't curse. But anyway, I digress. Verse 23, Then was the king exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed his God. Isn't that amazing? He believed his God. And because of that, no hurt was found on him. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, their wives, 
And the lions had the mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces or ever they came at the bottom of the den. I mean, they snatched them out of the air as they were falling and tore them up. That's how hungry these lions were. <laughs> then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell on all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you, I make a decree. Wouldn't you love to find this decree written on a piece of papyrus or stone or something? But it's written right here. That Darius made this decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever in his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall be even unto the end. Now this is a, notice a recurring theme. The rock kingdom is going to come and grind everything in pieces. It's going to stand forever and will not be destroyed, will not end. And then these are the things that are said by um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar that he testifies this is true. And now Darius is testifying this is true. Great King Darius. <clears throat> He delivers and rescues and he works signs and wonders in heaven and in earth who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian, which I was telling you was the great Cyrus. <coughs> so understand what happens. Darius the Mede was king over Babylon. He had conquered Babylon. But he was united with the king of Persia. But it's Cyrus the Great who became the mightier king. That's why it lifted up on its side. So chapter 7, can somebody switch to chapter 7? We're going to make a big transition now. This is a this is major shift in the way things are done. We are past, to some degree, the history of Daniel. We know that he served the king of Babylon and he served Darius the Mede. We know that um, you know, he was tested many times and he was faithful to his God. And it's testimony in Ezekiel is that he was faithful to his God. Absolutely true. Did you have a question? Yes, yes. Um, was Darius one of those uh, kings of the Persian king? He was probably an equivalent king to Cyrus the Persian. They were united together. So it'd be like uh, the, the leader of Canada and the leader of the United States decide to go to war together. So they were, they were buddies. But, go ahead. Probably Babylon, okay. not Persia. Because we're going to deal with Persia in Esther to some degree. You know, that when we deal with Persia, and suddenly there's a de declaration that throughout the entirety of the Medes and Persians' kingdom. And we're gonna, when we get to the maps, well, this will become a little more clear. But when you study the history of the Medes and the Persian, it's very similar to the other things I talked about. It can get very confusing. You know, it's almost like the names were changed to protect the innocent. You just can't figure out who's who. And people argue constantly over who was who, over what, when. And there are some things in Egyptian history that are desperately messed up that cause you to think that some of those kings did things they probably didn't do. It, it, it can just, I mean, I just have nowhere near enough time to even begin to lay out the problem, let alone solutions to the problem. But we can know this. There was a King Darius known as Darius the Mede, and you can find him in history. But there are people that claim that Darius the Mede may not be the King Darius of a later time. It may have been the King Darius who was actually the head general of the armies of Cyrus the Persian. I don't know. There's some confusion. But there was a King Darius the Mede who conquered Babylon. And then there was definitely Cyrus the Persian, Cyrus the Great. He was the mighty king who ruled over all the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. Definitely existed. And he was, he was powerful. He's like Nebuchadnezzar in that sense. He's powerful. The statue interpretation says very clearly that the kingdom that follows on Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold, and then the arms of brass, it would not be in the same strength as Babylon. It was larger. It was much larger. But it wasn't as strong as Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar ruled over everything with a, basically almost like with a rod of iron. He ruled over the whole kingdom. The Medes and the Persians was split amongst various provinces and groups, and you know the king was beholden, you know, the, he, that's why you have the Medes and the Persians. They worked together. They had to compromise with one another. But you'll see that the Persians began to take over. And they became really the great kings. And the Medes sort of sunk below. 
But anyway, so you, I hope you can follow that, but that's, the, the history can be a little bit confusing if you don't really handle it quite a bit. Okay, so chapter 7. We're going backwards in time. Now Daniel dreams in the time of Belshazzar. Remember, we just killed Belshazzar a couple chapters ago. So then Daniel's going to start talking about the times of the end. And he's going to testify of the dreams that he had. And he has two dreams in the time of Belshazzar. This is before the Mene Menel Tekel Ferris. It's before that. Daniel has seen Nebuchadnezzar pass on. The kingdom is ruled by other people. He's in Babylon. He knows the interpretation of things that come to pass. He knows the Medes and the Persians are coming. And he's crying out to God is really what's happening. Father, what's going to happen? How's this going to work? What's going to, what's going to occur? So he says here, he spakes and says, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came out of the sea, diverse from one another. Think about this picture now. Remember we went from the statue of gold, the statue of gold and silver and all that, and all the men looking at it going, oh, it's amazing, glorious, beautiful declaration of the kingdoms and the might of these kingdoms. Now we've got God's perspective, and Daniel sees God's perspective. What does he see? Four great winds, mighty torrents over the great sea. What's the great sea? That's the sea of humanity. What rises out of the sea? Four great beasts, terrible to behold. It's a different picture altogether. So what are these? We're going to find out. Okay. Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came out of the sea, diverse from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, and I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Wow. Behold, another beast, a second, like a bear. It raised up itself on one side, it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, Arise. Devour much flesh. It doesn't sound very good. It doesn't sound glorious. It sounds ugly. After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly it had great iron teeth it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and it had ten horns i considered the horns and behold there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots and behold in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, and thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, the judgment was set, and the books were opened. Does this sound like anything you've read before? It's revelation. I beheld, then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. I saw in the night visions, and this, I mean, this is amazing. And behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. That's an amazing vision that Daniel sees. Now, do you see there immediately the parallels between the vision of the statue that there's going to be these kingdoms that come and then there's going to be a great and everlasting kingdom that follows on but we got a lot of different detail in the first one there's these glorious kingdoms and then there's this stone that comes down becomes a mountain 
Now we've got these terrible beasts and we've got this glorious king mm -hmm. who is Jesus. Yes. It's going to come. It's a different perspective. But let's let the Bible interpret itself. Verse 15, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body and the visions of my head troubled me. He's very troubled over this. I came near unto one of them that stood by. Now who is that? He comes near to somebody who stood by. He's seeing all these visions. There's somebody standing by. So he comes near to this guy. He draws close to him and says, ask him, what's the truth of all this? So he told me. It made me know the interpretation of the thing. These four great beasts, which are four, are four kings. And in reality, you can read this as kings or kingdoms. For four kings which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and forever. Right? This is, this is it. That's the ten thousand thousands and all those people that ministered before the, the great and mighty king at the end. That's all the saints of God, right? Then I would know. Then he's, so, so here's the interpretation. We just got this long vision. There's going to be a bunch of kings, but at the end, Jesus is going to reign forever. Okay, that's really what this says. That's it. That's the interpretation. Daniel's going, wait, wait, wait. Time out. Time out. I want to know the truth about the fourth beast. This fourth beast is diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful. The teeth are like iron, nails of brass, devoured, breaking pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, I beheld in the same horn made, horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, so we're going to interpret it now, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and tread it down, and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. They shall arise. The kingdom's going to exist, but the ten horns shall arise from that kingdom, and shall be diverse, and, and, and another shall rise after them, and he's diverse from the first. He's going to subdue three of those kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of time. Time and times and dividing of times is three and a half. Just keep that in mind. But the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it into the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations much troubled me and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. He still doesn't quite, uh, he's, he's got a lot of questions. Okay? So let's look at this real fast. You see these the four, you got them on your paper there. First is like a lion, an eagle's wings, and man's heart's given to it. That represents Babylon. Remember how Nebuchadnezzar kind of got feathers and all that kind of stuff, right? But then he was lifted up and a man's heart was given back to him. There it is, it's right there. Second is a bear and raises on one side. I've commented on that a few times. It had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth and it said, Arise, devour much flesh. The Medes and the Persians conquered everything around. They conquered Egypt. They conquered Assyria. They conquered Babylon. Three ribs in its mouth. They wiped it out. Okay? They now took all three of those kingdoms whose power had been to, to oppress Israel were now eaten up by the bear who lifts up on one side. So you can understand it, okay? Another one, like a leopard, which upon the back of it, four wings of a fowl, and then it had four heads, and dominion was given to it. We're gonna learn a lot more about that kingdom later, so I'm just gonna leave it there, okay? Fourth beast, dreadful, terrible, strong, exceedingly. Notice it has iron teeth. Does that remind you of the legs of iron, right? Iron teeth, it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it was diverse. And we also saw in the interpretation where it had brass involved. That's important for the last days. 
this fourth beast is mighty and terrible, and that's the one Daniel's fixated on. The other ones, he's like, okay, yeah, I get it. What's going on with that fourth one? That's wild, okay? Can somebody switch the slide? Next one. Here's the picture. You have it in black and white, but you can see it here. See that mighty statue? And right next to it, a lion with eagle's wings and a bear with ribs in its mouth. And we got a leopard with fowl's wings, and we got this ugly, terrible thing with ten horns on it. That is how you look at this. Those beasts are same representation of those kings and kingdoms that are in that thing right there. Now, is that clear to everybody? Does anybody have any questions about that? Do you think that maybe we're just forcing it to say that? It's pretty obvious that that's how it works. That's the way it goes. And this is how you learn to interpret these things because it's teaching you, it's showing you this is how it works. It all fits perfectly. And when you get to Revelation, these are the things you've got to understand before Revelation make any sense. Okay? Everybody follows? Can you switch to the next slide? Now we're going to talk about maps. This is map time. For those of you that don't know your geography as well as you might like. Okay? Maps are a wonderful thing to help us. So if you look at this one, this is a map. Remember that these things are not exact, and all of these lines would actually be very fuzzy, you know, as to where people went. But the Babylonian Empire covers the whole delta of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Here's Babylon itself, Ur of the Chaldees, where Abraham was from, the kingdom of Elam, and all up into the kingdom of Assyria up here in the north. The Medes, by the way, are over here. Assyria, and down into Judah and Syria today. Here, right in where my thing is moving, that's where ISIS is killing people today. Okay, it's right in there. So the Babylonian Empire covers all of these kingdoms, and that's where Nebuchadnezzar ruled. It's relatively small compared to everything else, but it was, a, it was an absolute kingdom. So you can all follow. The places to look at, Mediterranean Sea is key. That's this big thing over here. Caspian Sea and the Persian Gulf. Most of you heard the Persian Gulf many times. We're always fighting over there. Next picture. This is the Persian Empire. This is the arms of silver. This is the bear. It's crushing. Notice it's got Assyria, it's got Babylon over here, and it's got Egypt. That's what I believe are the three ribs that it crushes. It also goes over here and takes over what is sometimes called Thrace, sometimes called Asia Minor. Today we call it Turkey. Funky name. And notice that Persia pushes way out over here. And notice here's Medea. Right there. The Medes and the Persians came out of the east and they conquered Babylon, they conquered Assyria, and they conquered Egypt. One of the things that's messed up in chronology is this whole idea of who actually conquered Egypt. Do you know the reality is, flip back a slide, this is what secular history would tell you. Actually, Nebuchadnezzar conquered Egypt. Bible tells us he did. Secular history says he didn't because they can't find proof of it and because they have a so messed up Egyptian chronology that they say that the Bible's wrong. I say the Bible's right. And he did. So in reality, Nebuchadnezzar had Egypt as well. So I wanted you to understand that you have Egypt, you have Assyria, and you have Babylon, and those three, the Persians came in and they took them. Okay, next back to the Persians. So we see this great Persian empire. Switch to the next one. Here's the beast with four heads. It's like a leopard. This is the Grecian Empire. They come out of Macedonia. Here's Greece proper, by the way, down here. It's Macedonia. Who's Macedonia? Ever heard of the Serbs and the Bosnians? Okay, that's, that's you know, hear all that striving going on over there? There it is. Okay. Here is uh, Turkey, parts of it. Here's Egypt, Syria, Babylon. When Alexander the Great conquered Babylon, he was crowned king of the world and said he was a son of Zeus, God. I mean, it's, it's pretty wild stuff. He then pushed all the way over here. This is when he said there's no more worlds to conquer. He was sad. 
He had no more to conquer, no more people to kill. He'd run out of stuff. And then he came back to Babylon and died. And out of his came striving amongst his generals. He had many great generals that worked for him and with him. And so when we take this and divide it into four, we've got the south, we got the Seleucid Empire here, so we've got Ptolemy, you may have heard of Ptolemy, who was the last great queen of the Ptolemies? Cleopatra, if you've ever heard that name. Ptolemies, Seleucid's Empire. This is where Antiochus Epiphanes came from, who's very much a type of the Antichrist. He actually went into Jerusalem and put up, sacrificed a pig on the altar and you know, made it abomination, which is what the Antichrist will do. And then here is the place that's sometimes called Thrace, sometimes called Turkey, sometimes called Asia Minor, and then here's Macedon. Those are the four divisions of the Greek Empire. Now notice this again. The Persians conquered this one, and this one, and this one. So did Alexander, came and conquered all three of those again. That's what's going on here. And we'll talk a lot more about this in a further chapter. So just for sake of argument, switch to the next slide. This is the Roman Empire. Notice down here, it's got all of that, those three big pieces. It's got them all. Um, and it's got a whole lot more. That's the one of iron that just stamped and crushed everything. Rome so dominated the world in that day that everything was Romanized. Okay? The whole world was Romanized at the time. And they, they basically brought everything into communication. They built roads. They did all kinds of stuff. All right, next slide. Let's talk about this. I considered. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Now, this is, we're talking about ten horns out of the mighty, ugly beast, right? Ten horns. And in the midst of them, a, a little horn comes up, and three of the first horns are plucked up. Now, see this recurring thing? These same three are plucked up by this horn. It gets them plucked up and by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things, which is exactly what is said in Revelation about this. The mouth speaking great things. It's pretty wild. And then is all the detail we read about the final judgment. What was, what was God focused on telling Daniel? final judgment the kingdom shall be given to the king of kings the true king of kings whose name is jesus yesu in spanish and and yes in japanese and and uh yesu in chinese and you know it's I mean, whatever the name his name is jesus his name is wonderful it's counselors mighty god that's that's who's going to take over that's what he's focused on but daniel's looking at this fourth beast going what's going on with that so what we'll find out is that, you know, God having mercy upon Daniel, he's going to tell him. He's going to show it to him. So does everybody follow that? Can you sort of see the geography? It is wild when you look at it and you understand that it's, it all fits perfectly. It's making clear what's going on. That part of the world, there is a lot going on in the spirit. So who started the Babylonian kingdom? His name was Nimrod comes long before the time of Daniel. Long before. He's right after the time of Noah. And we're not talking about that today because it's not part of what Daniel is, but that's why this is all happening. It is man striving against God. And God is going to have in his end. That's really what's going to happen. He's going to have his end. Okay. So I finished chapter 7. That's chapter 7. It's big, and we just brush the top of it if you want to study the history, but you can see how all of the terms that are used, the lifting up on the side, the chewing of the three, the, the, when we get to the, we're going to talk more about the leopard in a minute, but the four heads, the four parts, it was split. The kingdom was split and will be split into four portions. So Greece gets added into the mix here, okay? So then we move on to chapter 8. So two years later, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. So he gets another vision. And I saw in a vision, it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. 
and I saw in a vision that I was by the river Ulai. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram with two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. Remember I kept emphasizing to you that it was the Mede, the Persians, the Persians became greater, but notice the Persians came second. Darius the Mede conquered Babylon, but the Persians ended up being the dominant kingdom. So it came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so no beast might stand before him, neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. He's crushing. So you saw where they came from. We saw on the map. Here they are. Here's the Persians over here in the east, and they're pushing to the north and to the south and to the west, and they're conquering it all. Right? And as I was considering, behold, a he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. He had no table had a notable horn between his eyes. This goat comes rushing out, and it's moving so fast, they don't even touch the ground. Just moving like a rocket. Here it comes. The, the ram has pushed and conquered and crushed, and here comes this he-goat. Remember, we looked at the Grecian Empire, the belly and thighs of brass. We looked at it, it was a leopard. It's fast, but it had four horns, and it had fowl's wings. It was like a, a fast leopard with wings. I mean, it's just fast. So we got the same thing. A he-go coming fast out of the west. And what happens? This notable horn. He got a big old horn on it. He came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran into him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram. He was moved with collar against him, smote the ram, break his horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground, stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Historically, that is what Alexander the Great, as we call him, Alexander of Macedon, the son of Philip of Macedon, he became the great conqueror and he came out of the West and he wiped out the Persians. The Persians had been oppressing Greece for years. You've heard about the Spartan 300 and you've heard about the Battle of Thermopylae and you heard about Athens and the Battle of Marathon and all kinds of things that happened. They'd been fighting the Persians for a long time, holding the Persians off. They'd been trying to conquer Greece. Philip of Macedon united Greece under the Macedonians. He had developed some new warfare techniques that nobody had ever seen before. And he died. And his son Alexander took his army and went and didn't just fight off the Persians, he crushed them. If you study the battles, he should have lost every single one. But he won every single one through great strategy, with great fury. They attacked with a ferocity the Persians could not match. And that fits exactly with what this says was going to happen. Because remember, at the time Dan is writing this, Persia isn't even dominant yet. It's the reign of Belshazzar, the last regent of Babylon. It's his reign. Daniel's seeing this. This is what's going to happen. It's going to come to pass. I saw him come close to the ram, verse 7. There was no power to stand before him, deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. So I drew the, showed you in the Grecian Empire the four places, right? And out of one of them came forth a little horn. So out of one of those four horns came the little horn. Now remember, the little horn came before out of the ten. It was, it was separate from the ten. It was like an eleventh. Now one of the four has a little offshoot. So this, this little horn comes out of one of the four which waxed exceeding great toward the south, and toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. What's the pleasant land? It's Israel. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. It cast down some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Now that's wild. What does that represent? What do the stars of heaven represent? It's the angels. It's the powers that are so much mightier than we. This little horn rises up and stamps down some of the stars of heaven. And this is big time. Something going on here, okay? Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. A host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, 2,300 days 
Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. 2,300 days. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there appeared before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, isn't that great? First time we hear that name. Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face, and he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Whoa, that's wild. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright, and he said, Behold, I will make thee to know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed... The end shall be. So remember we saw early in the early church interpretations, this is about what's going to come to pass, King Nebuchadnezzar. It's about the end, it says, for the end of days. And then we see that thing. So all of this is about the end of days. How is it all going to come out, basically? It's important. Now as he was speaking with me, let's see, wait, wait, verse, end shall be verse 19, verse 20. The ram, which you saw, having two horns, are the kings of Medea and Persia. Now notice, I told you that because it just, I know it so well, but I should have waited and let it say it. But see what it says? You don't have to wonder who the ram is. You don't have to guess. It tells you right here. Right. The kings of Medea and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Greece, Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. Now, I want to explain something to you. That happened already. When Alexander went down, there were basically four kingdoms, but there are at least 23 generals mentioned. There was striving and changing of alliances and all kinds of stuff went on. But see, this vision is for the time of the end. So it actually happened. It was divided in the four pieces. It's actually happened. Anybody tells you it didn't happen, they're crazy. It happened. There was the Seleucid kingdom, there's the Ptolemy kingdom, there was the Thracian kingdom, and there was the Macedonian kingdom that fought with one another for, for many years. But this vision is for the time of the end. It's going to happen again that out of that area are going to rise up these four kingdoms. You're going to have a Grecian Macedonian kingdom, you're going to have an a Asia Minor kingdom, you're going to have an Egyptian kingdom, and you're going to have a... Uh, Syrian slash Babylonian kingdom. And you, that's when you hear people like Pastor Mark telling you, look today and see what's happening. Egypt is on fire. The Arab Spring is in all, and it, greater Egypt. You look at Macedon. We've been hearing the Bosnians and Serbs fight one another forever. They've been fighting and striving with one another. You hear the Turkey is just becoming radical where it, it's been very quiet for a long time. And ISIS is now messing up Assyria and trying to create things. So it's happening right before our eyes. This is happening. It's restoring what was there. It's reviving this kingdom that existed where it had been split into four. Okay? And so now that being broken, verse 24, stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand. So being broken, four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand out of the nation but not in his power. It's going to happen again. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. This is some impressive dude. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. What does that mean? Not by his own power. I will tell you this. Let's just make it very simple. We're going to read this in a minute, but let me just see so you can get a preview. There are mighty angelic princes that rule over the kingdoms of men. And there is a prince of Grecia, and there is a prince of Persia. And in, when this man stands up, there will be a prince ruling over him. And we'll say more about it later. So not by himself, his own power. And he will destroy wonderfully and prosper and practice and destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. He shall stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. 
So we understand, we believe that he's going to make peace with Israel. Is there peace with Israel in any of these areas right now? No, everybody hates Israel. They all hate them. But he is going to rise up, he's going to make peace with Israel, and he's going to fool them, basically. And then he's going to, in three and a half years into that final seven years, he's going to go in and he's going to take, he's going to break the peace. That's what's going to happen. But he shall be broken without hand, and the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. And I, Daniel, fainted, was sick certain days. Afterward I rose up and did the king's business, was astonished at the vision, but no one understood it. So, next slide. Oh, well, let, me, let me do this first. Go back. Just wanted to show it. These are the summary. Here's the important things. We've got the ram, the goat, the broken, the four come up, out of one of them a little horn, and then there's the 2,300 days. Next page. Here's a picture of it. You can see the goat coming out of the west and conquering the ram. And then there, this is the goat here and his four horns. And we've now labeled them. We got Thrace or Turkey. Why is my thing not working? Thrace or Turkey, Macedonia, Greece, Egypt, and then Syria, out of which will come that. Why do we say that Syria is the division? If you look back at the Roman Empire, the one piece, the Seleucid Kingdom is the one piece that's really not part of the Roman Empire. It's the one that's outside of the ten that are going to be in the Roman Empire. The Antichrist is also called in other prophecies the Assyrian. Okay? It makes it very clear where he's coming from. He's coming from Syria, greater Assyria, really, the greater area. He's coming out of that place, and he's going to conquer those other three places, the same ones that the Persians conquered, the same ones that, you know, everybody, you know, it's all going to be taken. It's going to be brought back together. That's the seventh kingdom in Revelation. Okay. So, next slide. And we'll move on to chapter 9. So anybody have questions about this? This is probably one of the hardest parts to deal with in the whole book. And it's still pretty clear. No, okay. I'm not. I'm used, that's why I call it greater Assyria. The Seleucid kingdom is one of the four kingdoms that came out when the notable horn was broken. The Seleucid kingdom is no more. There will be four kingdoms rise again in those same four areas. That's what we're seeing happening right now. And once they have risen, out of one of them, the Assyrian portion will come the Antichrist. And so these are the questions that are going to be left. When we finish Daniel, we're not going to have all the final answers to all this. What's the 2,300 days? I mean, we're not going to have answers to these things. But it sets us up to have asked the right questions so that when we go and study Revelation, go to Pastor Mark's Revelation study, it all makes sense. Oh, it's the answer to that one. Oh, that's the answer to that one. And we're going to get to more of that later in some of these later chapters. There's going to be more. Because we've got 9 through 12 to go through, okay? We're getting close to the end, and it's amazing. So I was thinking that this might be a time for another break.